G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. About a week ago, I asked for your unpopular AFL opinions and you guys came through with the goods like you always do. So in this video, I'm gonna to respond to some of your most unpopular AFL opinions. Like I said, I did ask for this about a week ago and um, you know, there's been a whole round of footy since. So I don't know how many of these would have been affected by a whole weekend of games, uh, but I think that makes it more fun. So let's crack straight into it. We got the first one from Joshua Kelty who says, someone has taken 30 seconds to take a set shot. There shouldn't be a mark paid off of that kick. The 30 seconds is for a set shot routine, not winding down the clock. I kind of like this. It would be nice if we could somehow legislate against that, where we see it time and time again where players sort of load up. I remember Shuey did it in the 18 grand final, actually. They, they load up as though they're going to have a shot and then they don't. I think your suggestion is an interesting one. It would be quite a radical change, so I could see it not going down well. You know, if it was like a 15 meter, meter backwards pass or something like that, that should probably be play on. I find it tough, though, if a player legitimately, you know, has a 50 meter shot and it gets marked on the goal line, by another forward. Like that should probably be counted as a mark, but you want to legislate against, you know, the chip kicks that are about 15 meters or similar and certainly backwards. So could we extend it out to like a 30 meter rule where it's a mark if it goes more than 30 meters? I think that gets tough for umpires. So I could see there being some teething issues with that, but I do kind of like the idea that we should legislate something around this as it is a little bit unfair sometimes. Giant 1995 says, Melbourne is going to slide down the ladder next season. Interesting. So um, I don't know if you posted this before it came out that Petrarca is likely to stay. You also got to factor in Melbourne did finish fifth last. So if you're saying they're going to slide down the ladder uh, from fifth last, that means, you know, genuinely into the bottom three or four. Um, that's, uh, that's a bold call. I don't think they'll fall off that hard. If you ask me to do it right now, I don't know if I'd have them in my eight, but... If they don't lose Petrarca and, you know, they keep a lot of their list together and Cozzy Pickett stays, which I think is going to happen, they'll lose Neil Bullen. Um, you know, from a list talent point of view, I don't see them falling away unless, you know, things really turn to shit next year. So I, f I find it hard to agree with that one. You know, if you're saying that they'll miss finals again, I'll agree. But slide from fifth last, that's a huge call, to be honest. Darth Jaja. Every player on the premiership winning team to play 18 games or more but miss out on playing the grand final should be awarded a premiership medal. I like the idea of this. Uh, I don't see any real reason why we need to make it only players who played in the grand final. I suppose one caveat you need to add to it is why is that player, why has that player come out of the team? You know, if they get dropped on form at the start of the finals and don't find their way back, do they then get a premiership medal? You tell me, I suppose. It would probably Probably needed to be on injury, um, but it is that hard to legislate, perhaps. Pius Footy said, Collingwood had a C-plus season relative to the adversities that they were plagued with. It came down to a two, two bad stretches of games, start of season and post buy. Two draws and enough wins that typically get you into the finals. So Pius Footy is naturally a big Pies fan. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, you know, grading their season's a little bit arbitrary always, and it's based on perspective. And as a Pies fan, you're going to have a different perspective on your boys than others and and it's different for different fans what is acceptable i still probably i don't know what i put them i think that i give them an f in my season review if it wasn't an f it must have been a d i think if you're a team that is a of course the running premier but in general a premiership contender i think you can mark a little bit more objectively around simply the result and simply the result wasn't good enough to play finals there for collingwood so I'll disagree, you know, in terms of my own rating, but, you know, I obviously respect a, a Pies fan, particularly a committed Pies fan and fan, uh, fan channel that Pies Footy is. Before we go any further, I just want to let you guys know that this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. There are a multitude of benefits to accessing something like therapy. First of all, it provides a great safe space to talk. You can share whatever is on your mind, whether it's stress or sadness, and you can have that without the fear of any judgment. And there's nothing wrong with having these conversations with friends or loved ones, but through therapy, you'd actually get guided advice from an expert. That is a trained mental health expert who is there to listen, ask questions, and help you see new perspectives. And one thing that I suspect people do is that they wait until the problems in their life reach such a level or a threshold that they feel like they then need to get therapy to fix it, whereas perhaps you could think about therapy as a source of personal growth. You don't necessarily need to have a clinical mental health issue such as depression, or anxiety before you can seek out therapy. So as I said, BetterHelp is the paid partner of this video and they're on a mission to make starting therapy easier. And getting started with BetterHelp is really easy. All you need to do is go to the link in this description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash true footy for 
from there you fill out a questionnaire and in most cases you'll get matched within a couple of days. And one of the best features about BetterHelp is that if you feel like the therapist you get isn't quite the right fit, you can switch to another one at no additional cost. If you're someone who is struggling and think you could benefit from a therapy session, go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy or visit the link in the description to get started. Clicking the link does support the channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. Felix Hoff says, the Brownlow medal should be done on Australian night. Um, I think that the Brownlow medal is a fun event and I enjoy it for what it is. I don't think I would change it. You could certainly have it before the first final, but I don't know if packing it all into the same night um, is necessarily ideal. I kind of like having it as its own thing, but I also don't really put a lot of stock into the Brownlow medal as a legitimizing award. I mean, I think it's nice and it's fun to watch and then I forget about it. It might be an unpopular opinion in itself. I don't think it means that much, but it is fun to watch and it is pretty good viewing, to be honest. Canville says Massimo D'Ambrosio not getting all Australian is a massive snub. Yeah, I, th I think this one comes down to do you pick a wingman or do you not? If you pick a pure wingman, D'Ambrosio would have made it. And time and time again, they do show a reluctance. I think maybe last year they might have picked two wings. Um, but there's not a lot of pure wings in the game that are top level. So that's a really tough one where somebody really top tier would have missed out and probably did have a better year. You know, I don't know who you'd say the weakest midfielder in the other rest of the All-Australian team is. I know Dacos was picked on a wing, but you've got to have him. Um, and I'd probably still go so wrong. But again, it just comes down to should they pick a true wingman? And if they do, then D'Ambrosio can certainly feel a little bit a little bit aggrieved about that. Diesel Power says, Waterman in a forward pocket of the All-Australian team is taking the piss. That is a very unpopular take with me. I, I couldn't ag uh, agree less, to be honest. Um, okay, like, it's one thing to believe that he should have missed out or he might not have made your team, but taking the piss, no way, in my opinion. I mean, he's finished top five in the Coleman, and you don't, you don't need to look at the Coleman and purely pick the biggest goal kickers. I think Waterman's output and his work rates as well, and considering the shit team that he played in, I think it was 53 or 55 goals he kicked, um, and there were plenty of times Waterman was working hard down the ground and collecting possession in the back 50, so I think I think he was a great choice, to be honest, an unbelievable year. Dean Beasel says, Harris Andrews, not AA, was just plain wrong. Take out Weedering or Ryan. Perhaps, perhaps, it's pretty hard to separate those three on this year's output. I, I think Weedering probably should have made it. To be honest, if you'd asked me to guess, I probably would have said Harris Andrews is more likely to make it than Luke Ryan, but I, I don't feel strongly about that. Frosty has one around concussion. He says, we need the buy before the grand final. It is a serious ticking time bomb before a key player is ruled out due to concussion and essentially sours the entire week. Imagine Carlton were to make the grand final. However, Mackay and Keanu collided in the final moments of a prelim and both were ruled out. So that is kind of true of any potential injury, right? If two players collide in the last minutes of a prelim and are both ruled out, um, that is always potential to happen. However, I agree that oh, this, is, this is different where concussion means it's mandated. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps you're right. I think as long as you have a buy in there somewhere, um, we had a pre-finals buy back in 21, I reckon, wasn't it? When the grand final was moved to Perth. I suppose I don't really mind. And you make a fair enough point that the concussion aspect of it would be really unfortunate. Again, it's one of those things where, you know, I don't think it's been a thing up until this point, right? I don't think we've had a player can rule out a concussion or a key, big key player ruled out of the grand final. I could be forgetting. But it might be one of those things where as soon as it becomes a thing and it occurs, then people will probably change their minds about it. But I wouldn't be surprised if that happens in the future, to be honest. Rob Kieran says, Alistair Clarkson has lost the ability and or the desire to be a good AFL coach. If the Roos start very poorly in 2025, I can see him getting sacked or walking by the middle of the year. Big call. I have no insight as to his... Um, you know, his commitment to the cause and, and his uh, motivation to be there at the moment and desire. Uh, I still will repeat myself time and time again, but I think North Melbourne's list, like I don't think he's well equipped to have a competitive team week in, week out. And I still, you know, I thought North did okay there for a little while. There's certainly an improvement on the previous two years and they're at the point where they'll, they'll only get better with more experience and more maturity in that team. And that's the, that's the key part here is like retaining the players that they do have. I am not personally concerned, but uh, I read that as a North fan who's aggrieved. So I respect your opinion. I just not sure I'm there yet. Eli Louth says North Melbourne won't be a bottom 14 next year. 
the the only issue uh, with that I think is just the, the, there was still a big gap between the bottom three teams and the next worst and I think I've said that for the last two years with West Coast and North saying that there's such a big gap there that it is hard to see either of them getting out of the bottom two and that has been true for the last couple of years West Coast and North have stayed there and Richmond this year came down so it's a simplistic way, perhaps, but I don't think illogical way to look at it. North Melbourne still only had three wins this year, and I'm not sure what the team who finished above West Coast was. I think Adelaide had, but I think it was like nearly, at least double, more than double, in fact. So that coupled with the fact that it's still going to be young, bearing in mind we haven't had the trade period yet, I'll be surprised, but they did play better for longer than West Coast this year. It just happened that West Coast had more wins. Marcelo says that Max Gorn did not deserve All-Australian, and Jaden said uh, Gorn deserved the All-Australian over Sherry, uh, even if it's by thin margins. I am erring on the side of Max Gorn did deserve it, to be honest. I mean, he still still played 21 games, and there was some injury-affected games at that, but averaging 34 hitouts, 19 possessions, he was top six in contested marks, and still five clearances a game. I have been... Talking up Tristan Sherry's year, uh, I could have seen a possibility where two players, two rucks got picked this year. I think it's not often that that is justified, and it would have been justified this year, in my opinion. So I'll still say Gorn over Sherry, but Sherry could be one of the more unlucky non-All-Australians. Gussie McStevo says Brisbane will go on a Bulldogs run. I presume you mean um, 2016, where they made it from outside the four and won it. So this has not been um, ruled obsolete because they are still in the competition. They play the Giants away and then they've got two MCG finals. So it is very tough. It is very tough, but your prediction is still live. It's not my prediction, but we'll see what happens. I suppose that's more of a bold prediction, but we'll see what happens there. Pickle Green Guy says, Frio don't need Bolton and Pickett. They're two very similar players. They should keep their good draft picks while they have them. Go for one or the other. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. They are somewhat similar. They would rapidly improve the... Well, they would improve any forward line, the efficiency of it. Um, I don't think they're extremely similar, but I can understand why you wouldn't want to throw tons of assets on uh, a small forward mid and a small forward who can also play a little bit of mid, but not a whole heap in... Um, I'm talking about Pickett. On the other hand, though, for where Frio's at, um, you know, I don't, I don't really think they need to be treating the draft as sacrosanct. I suppose with the Luke Jackson deal, they did have a couple of years where they didn't. They didn't hit it. So I think that's justified. I think as it turns out, um, you know, Pickett's probably going to stay in Melbourne. But Shea Bolton, I think, get that done. And you're still going to have one, maybe two first round picks. Riley, you legend says Cam Chester should be played as an inside midfielder permanently. I don't think this is actually super unpopular. Um, this is an Eagles related one. I think that it started to happen in the waffle. And I agree, he probably looks more natural as an inside mid than a wingman. Uh, probably just needs to work on finding a bit more of the footy, but that's not uncommon for young midfielders his age. I think he played halfback in the last game against Geelong. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I think uh, I think starting him in the guts next year at Waffle will be probably the go. Backyard Charizard says, Clayton Oliver wins the 2025 Brownlow medal. Man, that is a hugely bold prediction. Good to hear from you as well, Backy Char. Not going to join in with you on that one, um, but look, we know he's capable, so it wouldn't be the craziest thing. And it would be nice to see him at least get back to his best because he's... Very entertaining. Melbourne is an entertaining team when they've got those guys firing. Leon Mead says the father-son rule shouldn't exist. Like Collingwood shouldn't automatically have rights to Dacos cause just because his father played for him and teams that picked first like North really could have used him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a fair debate and um, I personally like the sentiment of it. I, I can be a contradiction sometimes where I you know, point out fairness here and then in other instances I'm like, nah, tradition's cool. So I suppose, I mean, I suppose that's fine, right? Everyone can have different viewpoints and different values. I like the father-son rule. There is no doubt, though, it's becoming... Well, it's produced unfair results. You know, the Bulldogs have profited from it, um, as have Collingwood with the two-day costs, Darcy Moore. Um, but you won't hear me campaigning against it, but I, I think what you're saying is logical, absolutely. Jaden says, the Suns will make and win a final before Essendon. Well, this is a tough one. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I think Essendon were better this year over the stretch. To be honest, I think Gold Coast young guys around 23, 24 have more upside. You know, Raul and Anderson and Flanders and Ben King, I think, is 24. Um, you know, Lacocious probably won't stay there, but I still would probably put him in that category. Bailey Humphrey. Essendon do have types like that, but I'd probably say that Gold Coast have a little bit more potential and they have Damien Hardwick. So it's logical, but I don't, I don't think it's 
crazy to suggest Essendon could win a final next year. I'm not as down on Essendon as the broader community, and in fact, their fans too. But I understand that going for your team is, is emotional. Gus Monfrey says, if Geelong gets a home or se- a semi or prelim, it should be played at GMHBA. Forget about massive crowds and money. Focus on the fairness of the comp. Home final is a f- home final. Cats would have a better advantage chan- uh, slash chance of beating the Hawks, Dogs, Blues at GMHBA. This is coming from someone who can't stand Geelong. I agree wholeheartedly here, to be honest. Not so much the grand final. I think there's another one around the grand final, but I think it's entirely fair that Geelong should be able to play their home finals at GMHBA. Because when you think about it, the MCG is more of a home game for Hawthorne. That is an absurd result. And I know that if it happened to to my club, um, which it can't, but if it hypothetically could, I would be absolutely fuming about it. So I absolutely agree. Uh, I'm sure Geelong fans would agree. Let us know if you don't have that stance. Actually, I do want to add one more thing on that. It is kind of stupid that they ha- they have played finals there, but it only they'll only do that for you know traveling teams who won't draw a big crowd. And I think Fremantle, on at least one occasion, played there at the G- uh, GMHBA in a final. I reckon that was 2013. I can't remember if there's been another final since. Maybe it was just one isolated example. But it- it's not fair that that would apply to Fremantle and not hypothetically someone like Hawthorne. Papley lives front free in your head says grand final stadiums should be awarded to the top team to make the granny not tradition or profit. I look again, this just comes down to preference. I don't have a logical answer for why I want the grand final MCG, but I just think it hits different. I even think back to 2015 West coast was the home grand finalist that year against Hawthorne. And I, I think it just would have not been the same had it been at Subiaco Oval. I think Optus Stadium is sick and it has produced one really good grand final in terms of, you know, the venue itself. But I like the MCG factor and it's ideal when the two finalists are are genuinely neutral. So if it's two MCG tenants or if it's uh, perhaps two interstate sides, we haven't seen that in 20 years. We may see that this year, who knows, but I love that. I would love to see an all Sydney grand final at the MCG. I just think it's it's the ground. It's It's gotta be that the MCG and it's gotta be in the day. Spin Doctor has strong views on the stand rule. He says it should be abolished. It was ridic- ridiculous to start with. Players can sometimes take two or three backwards steps and the umpire deems them as an outside five. Other times when two players are near the mark, the umpire calls stand and the players must play Russian roulette and guess which one of them he means. If the wrong one moves, it is 50. If both stay still, it is 50 again, as one is penalized for being in the protected area. That's fair. All in all, it is a ridiculous rule that solves a problem that never existed that is now uh, inconsistently applied. It was a massive penalty against players who are not trying to get an advantage. The old rule was perfect. One spot that you can't step over. Behind that, do whatever you want. I don't disagree with this. I think there's two issues here. First of all, why did the rule really come in in the first place? I think it's so that teams could move the ball quicker. That is basically why the AFL is thinking about the product of the game. And secondly, it doesn't help when it's inconsistently applied, as you say. So you won't find an argument against it for me. I would be intrigued to see if there's any data out there that see how much the game has changed because of this. Um, You know, someone a lot smarter than me with access to stats that I don't have, um, if they can track somehow the actual tangible impact this has had on improving the game. So I don't even know how you'd measure that. Like more average inside 50s, I suppose anyone can look that up, but that's probably not the best way to look at it either. Um, It's probably from the eye test. We've also seen 666 probably have a a more profound impact, to be honest. And I don't mind 666, even though that seemed to ruin my club, amongst other things. But 666 did not play West Coast hands. Dingo Dogman says, there should be 16 players on the field to reduce congestion. Have six on the bench, no sub and unlimited interchanges. Yeah, we see this in the women's game. It is a pretty radical change that I'm not sure I'm going to jump on board with. I am not one of those people who who thinks the game is boring or there's too much congestion. I kind of like the arm wrestle sometimes. Having said that, is that something we could try maybe in the first round of preseason games? You know, the unofficial ones. Can we just see what it looks like? Um, you know, I, I don't really have any real thoughts. I think it would have an impact on fantasy potentially, not that that should really be a priority, but yeah, it's an interesting one. Maybe in the preseason, we could see something like that. Jaden says St Kilda should trade Max King. Shown they are more than capable for without him, which makes them less predictable. And King will have insane demands. So you'll get a star player slash multiple first round picks for him. Um, I am one of those people that thinks uh, Max Gorn should be the crown jewel of St Kilda's forward line. And he's only 24, so I get your point about draft picks, but I think 
this is a guy who could genuinely be an A grader. Um, and I think he's flirted with it and he's still young enough that he could very conceivably get there in the next few years. If I was a Saints fan, I would be pretty firmly against it, but that's just my position. Rogi says, Collingwood's youth isn't as bad as some may think. Obviously there's day cost, but players we have already playing in our 22 with Quainer, McCreary and Hill are arguably in their, before their prime with promising players like Harrison, Dean, Parker and Allen all looking to cement their spots. Future isn't all doom and gloom. Just as an aside, Parker hasn't even had a preseason, and Dean has only had one year of being fit. Don't count them out as legitimate options as youth. There's definitely some guns in there, and both Dacos kids are fairly young. I think, I forget, Josh is probably mid-20s, and Nick is like 21, 22. Quino's pretty young as well. Yeah, as you say, there, there is some genuine youth there. But I've been in this position before. When your team is, you know, at the top of the cycle, and your youth has come in and you're like, oh, that was a pretty good effort. I remember Luke Edwards tearing up Richmond once. And you find that once the stars start to fade, those players don't look as good. And I'm not, I'm not actually disagreeing with you. I don't have strong opinions on these guys. I do think the players you mentioned by name are pretty damn good. But I have been in the position where you think your youth is a little bit better than it is simply because the team and the system are working and they're getting protection. And then suddenly when they're really exposed, they don't turn out so good. So I would just bear that in mind. Collingwood actually has done a pretty good job of, um, you know, building a premiership list without really doing well in the first round of drafts, other than a few obvious exceptions. Um, but two of those were father-son in, in Moore and Dacos, but to go, it was a pretty good selection in hindsight. Real Swift says, Cohen Livingston is a strong chance to play senior footy next year as one of West Coast's main rucks, showing a lot at waffle level this year and could be an acceptable fix for our rock problem at uh, AFL level. I didn't see a lot of Cohen past the pre-seasons. Um, I think West Coast have a bit of a dearth of good rocks, if that wasn't a very obvious. Matt Flynn and Bailey Williams, um, you know, probably disappointed us a little bit this year. Harry Barnett's had an off year. I'd certainly say Livingston's um, ahead of him. It would probably require a few injuries before he's really getting in that team as a main ruck. But I do think he's probably closer to it than Barnett. And I suppose by default, that makes him not that far away. So we could say and see him debut. Um, if we're at the point where he's getting regular games, I'm probably that probably makes me a little bit more nervous. Dean says, Eagles delivered above expectations according to the whole industry's opinion of us this year. Had a better year than Collingwood compared to expectations. I think that... Personally, my take was always that the media expectation of us, the industry's expectation, was always wrong. Um, and in fact, I am a little bit disappointed that we didn't exceed more significantly what others were saying about us. My logic was being that we'd have a fitter injury list than we did. We had, um, you know, we finished third last and we were probably the red hot favorite for the wooden spoon this year. I always thought that was a bit off, um, but I did also expect it to do better. So that's just my take on it. We did exceed the expectations from us, but I think the expectations on us were a little bit misguided. And personally, I don't think we improved as much as I'd like. And finally, the Metal Pig says, the awards season have become nearly meaningless. Poor, poor criteria for selection that doesn't match the modern game. Reed and Darcy in, ineligible for the Rising Star, which is about star potential, not best and fairest, to Heaney and the Brownlow. Both awards were affected by new rules reacting to concussions that have no place in fairness, but it's wrong place and wrong time and being unlucky or whether you have a good lawyer to get you off. Missing games due to suspension should be enough punishment because then you can't get votes. And AA selection of plays out of position, Dacos on a wing and he on a forward flank when both played 99% midfield time is disrespectful to the players who played wing like D'Ambrosio. Fair enough. Again, uh, so on the All Australian point, we did sort of discuss that earlier in this video and um, I sort of agree. I sort of agree. I'm a little conflicted because would you not have Dacos and Heaney in the team in general? I get the logic on it. Um, so I'm a little bit more conflicted about that. I do agree with you on the rising star inel ineligibility and obviously, biased Eagles fan, um, I didn't even know that Harley Reid was ineligible because he got suspended until it happened. I didn't know that was a rule. Perhaps they can um, you know, consider the grading or, or a type of incidents that doesn't make you ineligible from the brown low. Like fair enough if you punch someone, um, you know, like do an Andrew Gaff or Jimmy Webster perhaps. But if we're talking about these little incidental things that are just second decisions that are really unlucky and we've seen so many of these this year, I do agree with you. I don't think the Brownlow or the Rising Star should rule you ineligible for that. There you have it, guys. That was a fairly long one. Your AFL Unpopular Opinions, the finals edition. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, thank you for contributing as well. Appreciate you watching. Appreciate you being subscribed. I'll see you next one. Cheers.